So uh, the talk today is about scikit-learn, or in other words, why I think scikit-learn is so cool. Uh, first of all, uh, I would like to ask you uh, three questions. Not what's your favorite color, actually, but uh, if you already know what machine learning is. How many of you? Oh, great. Okay. Perfect. Uh, the second one is, have you ever used scikit-learn? Okay. And the third one is, how many of you also attend this, the great training on scikit yesterday? Okay. Okay. It's just two uh, brief questions. Okay. So, uh, what actually machine learning means? Uh, machine learning, uh, there are many definitions about machine learning. Uh, one of this uh, is machine learning teaches machines how to carry out tasks by themselves. Okay? This is very trivial, very simple definition. And it's that simple. The complexity comes with the details. Okay? This is a very general definition, but just to, to give you the intuition uh, behind. Machine learning at a glance. Machine learning is about algorithms that are able to analyze, to crunch the data, and in particular to learn the data, okay, from the data. Uh, they basically uh, exploits statistical approaches. So that's why statistical is a, is a very huge word in this cloud, okay. Machine learning is almost related to data analysis techniques. Uh, there are many buzzwords uh, about machine learning. Mm, you may have heard about data analysis, data mining, data, big data, and uh, data science, okay? Uh, data science actually is the study of the, the generalizable extraction of knowledge uh, from data. And machine learning is related to data science according to uh, Drew Conway with this Vern diagram. Machine learning is in the middle, okay? And data science is a part of machine learning because it exploits machine learning. Machine learning is a fundamental part in the data science steps, okay? But what's, uh, what it is actually the relation of data mining and data analysis in general with machine learning? Um, machine learning is about to make predictions, okay? So instead of only analyze the data we have, Machine learning is also able to generalize from this data. Okay, so we ha the idea is we have a bunch of data. Okay, we may want to crunch these data to make st statistics analysis on this data, but and that's it. Okay, this is also called data mining, for instance. Machine learning is a bit different because machine learning performs this analysis, but the the goal is a slightly different. The goal is analyze this data and generalize, try to find, a, to learn from this data, a general model for future data, for data that are already, uh, that are almost unseen at this time, okay? So the idea is a pattern exists in the data. We cannot pin this pattern manually, but we have data on it, okay? So we may learn from this data. In other words, this kind of learn is also known as learning by examples, okay? Machine learning comes in two different settings. Uh, there is the supervised settings. This is the general pipeline of a machine learning algorithm. Uh, you you uh, have all the data uh, on the upper left corner. You translate, uh, you translate the data in a feature vectors. This is all, uh, almost uh, a common step in preprocessing the data. Then you feed those feature vectors to your machine learning algorithm. And the supervised learning setting supports also the, uh, the labels, which is the set of expected results on this data. And then we combine, we generate this model. Uh, from feature vectors and labels, and we generalize, the, we, we get the model to predict for future data in the uh, bottom uh, left corner of the figure, okay? Uh, uh, a classical example of supervised learning is the classification. You have two different groups in, of data in this case, and you want to find a, a general rule to separate these data, these data, okay? So you, you find in this case, a function that separates the data, and for future data, you will uh, you will be able to to know which is the class. In this case, it's a binary classification, so you have two classes. And in the future, when you get new data, you will be able to predict which is the class associated to this data. Another example is the clustering. 
Uh, in this case, the setting is called unsupervised learning. The pipeline processing is this one. You have the same old processing, but what you miss is the label part, okay? Because that's why this is called unsupervised, because you have no supervision on the data. You have no label to predict, okay? And uh, for, as for the clustering, the problem is get a bunch of data and try to clusterize, in, in other words, to uh, separate the data into different groups, okay? So you have a bunch of data, you want to identify the groups inside this data, okay? Just a brief uh, introduction. So what about Python? Python and data science are very related nowadays. Actually, uh, Python is uh, getting more and more packages to, for computational science. According to this graph, Python is uh, a cutting edge technology for this kind of computation. It's about almost, it's in the upper uh, right corner. And uh, actually it's um, replacing um, and substituting other technologies. One of the advantages, such as R or MATLAB, for instance, one of the advantages of Python is that Python provides a unique programming language across different applications. It has a very huge set of libraries to exploit. And this is the case, this is why the reason why Python is the language of choice nowadays for data science, almost the language of choice. And this is displacing R or MATLAB. And by the way, uh, there will be also uh, a PyData uh, conference at the end of the, of the week. It will be started on Friday, so if you, if you can, please come. Uh, data science in Python. Actually, MATLAB can be easily substituted by all these technologies, such as IPython, NumPy, SciPy, and Matplotlib for plotting. But there are many other possibilities, for, especially for plotting nowadays. R, it uh, could be easily substitu substituted with Pandas. It's a great package. And in the Python ecosystem, we have also um, efficient uh, Python interpreters that have been compiled for this kind of computation, such as Anaconda or uh, and thought Canopy. And we have also Cyton or projects like Cyton. Cyton is a very great project to allow to, to boost the computation of your Python code. Okay. The packages for machine learning in Python are manifold, actually. Uh, I, I, I'm trying to, 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 to uh, describe a, a bit all the a set of uh, well known packages for, um, for machine learning code and uh, I would like to, 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 to make some consideration on why scikit-learn is a very great one, okay? Uh, we have Spark machine learning lib, PyML, natural language toolkit, NLTK sometimes called, the Shugun uh, machine learning toolbox. This morning there's been a talk about it. Uh, scikit-learn, of course, PyBrain, MLPy, okay? And th there is a guy who uh, set up a list at, at this uh, on a GitHub where um, everybody can put his uh, or her contribution to this list uh, in order to distribute the, the knowledge about available packages in different languages, and Python is very full of. Okay. Um, so we have Spark MLib. Spark MLib actually is implemented in Scala. It's not uh, Python. It's, uh, there is a wrapping in Python, which is called Py. Py uh, Spark, but actually the library for machine learning is at a very early stage. Uh, Shugun is uh, written in C++ and it offers a lot of interfaces. Um, one of these interfaces in Python. Uh, the other packages there are Python powered. So we are trying to, 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 to talk about these packages. Uh, Natural Language Toolkit is for it's implemented in pure Python, okay? So no NumPy or SciPy are allowed. But the other packages are implemented in NumPy and SciPy. So the, the code there is uh, quite more efficient for large-scale computations. Uh, NLTK supports Python 2, and Python 3 is also in a alpha stage. PyML supports Python 2. Actually, the support Python 3 is not so clear. Um, PyBrain supports only Python 2, and 
these are the two guys there suppose both Python 2 and Python 3. Okay. Uh, what about the purpose of these packages? NLTK is for natural language processing. Okay, it embeds some algorithms for machine learning, but actually it is not supposed to be uh, used in complete machine learning uh, environment. It's almost related to text uh, analysis, natural language processing in general. PyML is almost um, focused on supervised learning, in particular to SVM technique, which is support vector machine. Okay, it does many uh, algorithms, especially related to uh, supervised learning. PyBrain is for a nat neural network, with, which is another set of techniques in the machine learning ecosystem. The other two guys there are somewhat general purpose, okay? So scikit and machine learning Pi are f contains algorithms for supervised, unsupervised learning and some other different, slightly different settings for machine learning, okay? So we're, um, we remove, uh, we will not consider anymore the uh, PyML and PyBrain, okay, from here on. So uh, we ended up with th these three uh, libraries written in Python for our machine learning code. So why to choose scikit-learn? Uh, ben Loriker, it's a, a, he's a, a big data guy, recommends scikit-learn for six reasons. The first one is commitment to the documentation and usability. Scikit-learn has a brilliant documentation. And it's very, very useful for newcomers and for people uh, without any background about machine learning. The second reason is models are chosen and implemented by a dedicated team of experts. And then the, the set of models supported by the library covers most machine learning tasks, okay? Um, Python and PyData improves the support for uh, data science um, data science tools, data science problems, and actually, uh, I don't know if you know Kaggle. Uh, Kaggle is a site where you may uh, apply for competition for data science, and Scikit is one of the most used package for this kind of competition. The, 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 the another reason should be the focus. Second Learn is a machine learning library and its goal is to provide a set of common algorithm for, to Python users through a consistent interface. These two features are two of the features that I like the most. Okay, I will be uh, more precise in a few slides about this. And, and finally, but by no means, um, so last, but I know means least, scikit-learn scales to most data problems, okay? So scalability is another feature that scikit-learn supports out of the box. If you want to install scikit-learn, you have to pip very few comments. You need to install NumPy, SciPy, Matplotlib, IPython actually is not needed, it's just for convenience, and then you install scikit-learn. All the other packages, uh, NumPy and SciPy in particular, are required because scikit-learn is based on NumPy and SciPy, okay? But anyway, if you want to install other uh, version of the Python interpreter, such as Anaconda, it's already provided out of the box. The design philosophy of scikit, it's um, one of the greatest feature of this package, I guess, uh, in my opinion. It includes all the batteries necessary for general purpose machine learning code. It has, a, it's, it supports uh, features for and functionalities for data and data sets, feature selection, extraction, feature extraction algorithms, machine learning algorithms in general in different settings, so classification, regression, clustering, and stuff like that. And finally, evaluation functions for cross-validation confusion metrics. We will see some examples in the next slides. The algorithm selection philosophy for this package is try to keep the core as light as possible and try to include only the well-known and largely used machine learning algorithms, okay? So the focus here is to be as much general purpose as possible, okay? So in order to include a broad audience of users. At a glance, this is a, a great, uh, <coughs> sorry, 
this is a great uh, picture depicting all the, 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 the features uh, provided by scikit-learn. And this uh, figure here is, has been gathered by the documentation. This is a sort of map you may follow to, that allows you to, to choose the, the particular machine learning techniques you want to, to use in your machine learning code. There are some clusters in this picture. There is regression over there, classification, clustering, and dimensionality reduction. And you may follow this kind of uh, path over there to, to decide which kind of, which is the setting most suited for your problem, okay? The API of Scikit is uh, very uh, intuitive and uh, mostly consistent to every machine learning technique. Uh, there are four different uh, objects. Th there is the estimator, the predictor, transformer, and the model, okay? The, uh, th these interfaces are implemented by mo almost all the uh, machine learning algorithms included in the library. For instance, let's make an example. The API for the estimator is uh, the method fit, okay? The, uh, an estimator is an object that fits a model based on some training data and is capable of um, inferring some properties on new data. For example, if we want to, to create an algorithm which is called KNN or K neighbors classifiers, we the KNN algorithm, which is a classifier, so it's, uh, it's for classification problems and then supervised learning. It has the feed method, but for all, all uh, also, sorry, for also unsupervised learning algorithm, such as K-means, the K-means algorithm is an estimator as well, and it implements the feed method too. For feature selection, it's almost the same, okay? Then the predictor. The predictor provides the predict and the predict probability method. And finally, the transformer is the transform, uh, is about the transform method that, uh, and sometimes there is also the fit transform method that applies the fit and then the transformation of the data. The transformer is used to, to, to make transformation of the data in order to, 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 to make the data uh, able to end in, in, a, in a form that is able to uh, be processed by the algorithms. Finally, the last one is the model. The model is um, the, the general model you may create in your machine learning algorithm. The model is for supervised and for unsupervised algorithms. And another great feature of machine learning, of uh, Scikit, is the pipelines, because um, Scikit provides a great way to create uh, pipeline processing. So in this case, you may create a pipeline of different processing steps, okay, just out of the box. You may apply these, select KBAS, which is feature selection step. Then after the feature selection, you may apply PCA. PCA is a feature, is a, an algorithm for uh, dimensionality reduction. And then you may apply logistic regression, which is a, classif a classifier, okay? So you may instantiate a pipeline processing very, uh, very easily, okay? So, and, and then you call the fit method on the pipeline and the fit method will, um, and then the predict. The only constraint here is that the last step of the pipeline should be a class that implements the predict method, so a predictor, okay? So far so good? Okay, great. So let's see some examples, scikit in action. We have, uh, it's very uh, introductory uh, example. Um, the first thing to, to consider is the data representation. Actually, Scikit is based on NumPy and SciPy, as you know. So all the data are usually represented as matrices and vectors. In general, in machine learning, by definition, we have the X matrix over there, which is usually uh, identified by the capital letter because it is a matrix. Uh, as a matrix of uh, n different rows and d different colors. In this case, oh, I'm sorry, in this case, n is the number of samples we have in our data set, and d is the number of features, so the number of um, relevant information on the data we have. Okay, so the data comes 
the training data come uh, in this flavor, and it, under the hood, it is implemented by scipy.sparse matrices, okay? Usually it is, uh, if I'm uh, not mistaken, it should be CSR implementation, so comma, sparse uh, row, a compressed sparse row, okay? And finally, we have the labels, because uh, we know the, the, the values for each of this uh, data ab about the problem we have. And the problem we are going to consider is about the iris data set and we want to design an algorithm that is able to automatically recognize iris species, okay? So we have three different species of iris. We have iris versicolor in, on the left, iris virginica here, and uh, iris setosa here, okay? Um, the features we're going to consider are four and are the length of the sepal and the width of the sepal, the length of the petal and the width of the petal, okay? So every data in this data set comes as a vector, every sample, sorry, comes as a vector of four different features, okay? This four here. Scikit has a great uh, package to handle the data sets. Actually, this particular data set is very well known in many fields and uh, is already embedded in the scikit-learn library. So you uh, only need to import the dataset package and call the load iris, and then you, you call the function load iris, and the iris object is a bunch object that contains different keys. It has the target names, the data, the target, a description of the dataset, and the feature names, okay? Description is the descript a verbose description of the dataset. Feature names are the four different features I already mentioned in the previous slides. The target names are the, the targets we expected on this data set, in particular Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica, the three different iris species we want to predict. Then we have the data. So we, uh, iris.data comes as a NumPy matrix, NumPy and the array. The shape of this matrix is uh, 150, 100, uh, 150 rows, times four, uh, four, which is four different colors, uh, columns. And the targets are 150 because we have a value for the target, a uh, value of target for each sample in the data set. So N, the number of samples in this case is 150. D, the number of feature in this case is four. And that's it. Um, the targets, here is the, the, the result of the target. Okay, so we have a value that ranges from zero to two, corresponding to the three different classes we want to predict. We might try to apply a classification problem on this uh, data. We want to exploit the KNN algorithm. The idea of the KNN classifiers is pretty simple. Uh, in, for example, if we consider a, a K which is equal to six, we're going to uh, check the, um, the the classes. As if, uh, this is the, a new data. We train our model with the, the, the training data, and we want to predict the class of this new data uh, on the, um, the the classes of the the six nearest neighbors of this data. Okay, in this case, uh, should be the Virginica. Okay, the the, the dot uh, the red dot. Okay, very simple. In Scikit, few lines of code. We import the data set, we call the k neighbor classifier algorithm. In this case, we select n neighbors equals to one. Then we call the fit method and we train our model. Then if this is what we get, actually, if we want to plot the data, these, these are called the decision boundaries of the classifier. And if we want to know for new data, which is the kind uh, which is a species of iris that has three centimeter times five centimeters uh, sepal and four times two centimeters uh, petal width. Okay, right. Let's check iris dot target names of knn dot predict because knn is a classifier, so it may fit the data and also predict uh, after the training. And it says, okay, it's a virginica. Okay. So far, so good? Right. Then we may also try to, uh, instead of 
um, facing this problem as a classification, you may also face this problem as a in an unsupervised setting, so as a clustering problem. In this case, we are going to use the k-means algorithm. The k-means algorithm, is the idea is pretty simple. The, we want to recreate an, a, a cluster of object, and each, each object is equally distant to the center of this, of this uh, cluster, okay? And that's it. In scikit, it's very simple. We have the k-means. We, we specify the number of clusters we want to have in the k-means. In this case, we want three clusters because we're going to predict three different um, species for the iris. And then this is the ground through. So this is the, the value we expected. This is what we got after calling the uh, k-means. As you may uh, already uh, notice, the interface for the two algorithms is exactly the same even if the machine learning settings are completely different. In the former case, it was supervised. In this latter case, it's unsupervised. Okay? So classification versus clustering. Finally, very few slides to conclude. Uh, another great battery included in Scikit, and I'm, uh, I don't know how many other Machine learning uh, libraries in Python are, are so complete in terms of batteries is about the module evaluation algorithm. Module evaluation isn't necessary to know how do we know if our predictor or our prediction model is good. So we apply model validation techniques. We may uh, simply try to verify that every prediction corresponds to the actual to the actual target, okay? But this is meaningless because we're trying to verify if we train all the data on the training, okay? So this is this kind of evaluation is very poor because uh, because it's based only on the training. So we we are just checking if we are uh, able to feed the data, but we are not able to uh, to test if the model, the final model, is able to generalize. Okay? Because a key feature of this kind of technique is the generalization. So, no uh, go too much to the training data because it's, it, you will end up in a problem which is called overfitting. But you need to generalize to, to, to be able to noise and to be able to predict even new data that are not actually uh, identical to the training data. Okay? One Usually, uh, technique, uh, use a technique in machine learning is the so-called confusion matrix, okay? Um, Scikit provides, or in the, the matrix package, provides different kind of metrics to evaluate your performance. In this case, we're, we're going to use the confusion matrix. The confusion matrix is very simple. It's a matrix where uh, it, it's the number, of, it has, it's a square matrix where the rows and the columns correspond to the number of classes you want to predict. Okay, and in the diagonal, you have all the, the classes uh, that you expect with respect to the classes that you predict. Okay, so you have all the possible matchings. If you have all the data there on the, um, on the, the diagonal, it tells that you predicted perfectly all the classes. Okay, is that clear? Okay, great, thank you. But a, um, a very well known uh, for you guys that are already aware of machine learning is the cross-validation technique. Cross-validation is a mode of validation techniques for assessing how the results of the statistical knowledge of the data is able to generalize to independent data sets, not only to the data set we used for training, okay? And Scikit already provide all the features to handle this kind of stuff. So Scikit, uh, I'll, um, imposes us to write very few code, just the few lines of code necessary to import the functions already provided in the library. Um, in other cases, we were, need, we were required to implement this kind of function over and over for every time in, in our Python code, okay? So this is very, um, very useful even for lazy programmers like me, okay? In this case, we have, we exploit the train test split. So we, the idea of the cross-validation here is uh, the, to splitting the data, uh, uh, the training data in two different sets. Uh, 
uh, the, the, the training set and the test set. So we fit on the training set and we predict on the test set, okay? So in this case, we will see, we, we, we see that there are some errors, okay, coming from this prediction, okay? This is a more robust way to evaluate our prediction model. Okay, so the last couple of things, thank you, the last couple of things is large scale out of the box, okay? Another great battery included in Scikit is the support for large scale computation in already out of the box. You may combine scikit-learn code with every library you want to use for multiprocessing or parallel computation, distributed computation, but if you um, want to exploit the already provided features for this kind of stuff, some uh, there are many techniques in the library that allows for a parameter which is called n underscore jobs. If you set these parameters with a value different to one, which is the default value, it uh, uh, perform the performs the computation on the, the different CPU you have in your machine. If you put the minus one value here, um, this means that it is, it is going to exploit all the CPUs you have on your uh, single machine, okay? And this is uh, for different settings or for different kind of application in machine learning. You may apply multiple processing for clustering, the k-means examples uh, we made uh, a few slides ago, for cross-validation, for instance, or for a grid search. Grid search is another uh, great feature included, a feature included in Scikit that is able to identify the best parameter for a predictor that, for a predictor that maximizes the value for the cross-validation. So we want to get the best parameters for our model uh, that maximizes the cross-validation, so that is able to generalize the best, okay? Just to, 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 to give the intuition. Okay, this is uh, mm, possible thanks to the joblib uh, library, which is provided in the background, okay? So under the hood, it, the new number jobs here correspond to a call to the job lib, okay? The, the job lib is well documented as well, so you might read the documentation for uh, any additional details. And last, but by no means least, Scikit meets any other libraries, okay? Uh, sorry, uh, Scikit could be integrated with an LTK, that is, that is natural language toolkit, and for Scikit image, just to, to make a couple of examples. In details, Scikit meets natural language toolkit uh, by design, NLTK includes a, an additional module, which is nltk.classify.scikit-learn, which is actually a wrapper in the NLTK library that allows to translate the API of Scikit in the API used in NLTK, okay? So if you have code on NLTK, you want to apply a classifier exploiting the Scikit library, okay? You may translate, you may import the classifier from Scikit, and then you may use the scikit-learn classifier class from the NLTK package over there, and um, wrap the interface for this classifier to the one of Scikit that it is in this case linear SBC, that stands for support vector classifier, okay? And then you may also include this kind of stuff in a pipeline processing of Scikit. So, in conclusion, Scikit-learn is not the only machine learning library available in Python, but it is powerful and, in my opinion, easy to use. Very efficient implementation provided. It's based on NumPy, SciPy, and Cyton under the hood. And it is highly integrated, for example, in an LTK or Scikit image, just to make an example. So I really hope that you're uh, looking forward to using it. And thanks a lot for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you, Valerio. We have uh, six minutes left for your questions. Please raise your hand and I'll come by with the microphone.
Uh, well, thanks for the talk. I have uh, two short questions. Does yep. scikit-learn provide any online learning uh, methods? Yes. Yes. Yeah, actually, yeah. The, this is a point I, I, I wasn't able to include in the slides. The online learning is already provided, and there are many classifiers or techniques that allows for a method which is called partial fit. Okay, so you have the, the, this method to uh, provide the the model a bunch of data one at a time. Okay, so the interface has been ex extended by a partial fit method. So some techniques allow for online learning, and another very um, great uh, usage of this partial fit is in case of the so-called out-of-core learning. In that case, uh, the, the, in the out-of-core uh, out uh, learning setting, your, your data are too, too big to fit in the memory. Okay? So you provide the data, one bunch, bunch of data one at a time, because they're too big to fit in the memory. So you call the partial fit method to train, in case of a classifier, to fit your model a bunch at, uh, a, bunch at a time. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, second, so, uh, yeah. uh, quick question. Um, is there any support for missing values or missing labels apart from just deleting them? In case of online learning, you uh, No, just in general, for any machine learning. For missing labels? Missing labels or missing data. Um, what do you mean? So, like, if you have a feature vector that just misses, like, a uh, value at the third uh, component. Uh, actually, I don't know. Okay. Actually, I don't know. Yeah, thank you. I'll just let... Come by. So we have a very simple imputer that's going to impute by uh, a median or mean in the different directions. Uh, so if you have very few missing data, it's going to work well. If you have a lot, uh, then you, you might want to look at matrix completion uh, uh, methods, which we do not have. We had a Google Summer of Code project on this last year. It didn't finish. We welcome contributions, of course. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Um, I have some experience, actually, with Psyche before. And, um, I'm not actually a mathematician. I haven't. Uh, I had no uh, idea about all the the stuff under the hood, and I didn't want to deep to inside uh, to be too deep inside of, of the whole algorithm stuff and mathematics and such. And the biggest problem for me was to realize what do I do wrong. So if you got some kind uh, of big data set with features labeled supervised uh, learning. Uh, how, what, what would you um, advise to someone who doesn't uh, know how does it work inside? Uh, what, which steps or which um, sm small or easy solutions should I uh, consider to improve the results of the classific classification? Thanks. Yeah, actually, um, machine learning is about finding the right model with the right parameters, okay? So there are many steps you may uh, want to apply in your training the different algorithms. In general, you apply data normalization steps. So you, you might, first of all, the, the, the first step I suggest is pre-processing of the data, okay? So you analyze the data, you make some uh, statistical tests on the data, some pre-processing, some visualization of your data in order to know what kind of data you're dealing with, okay? So this is the first step. The second one is try the, the simplest model you, you, you want to apply and then improve it one step at a time, okay? If you find the right model you want to use, then you want to um, find, you should, you're required to find the best settings for that model, okay? In that case, you might end up using the grid search method, for instance, which is a method provided out of the box just to find the best combination of parameters that maximizes the values of the cross-validation, for instance. And, of course, it's uh, a training on the job, right? So you... you you may find the, 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 the right model for your predictions, or you may find the worst model, and then you start over again and look for different models. Okay?
hope it, hope, hope it this helps. By the way. Yes, uh, thanks again, Valerio. I think he is going. He's going to give a talk at Pay Data as well. I think on Saturday, isn't it? Yep. On Saturday. So if you attend Pay Data, don't uh, miss that talk as well. And yeah, thanks again. Thank you very much.